Well, I'm really happy to be here, and I really, this is the third time I've heard the praise band. What a great band. Can we give them a hand? I mean, I was telling them that I now memorize those songs after this is my third service. So they're great, especially the last one. I really like that about the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit is here. It comes, but it doesn't stay in the building. Where does it stay? In our hearts. So that's what uh, we want to think about today. As I share information to you from uh, the Word of God, I would pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would impart that to you in a way that would make a difference. And I hope that does happen. So I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and, uh, and a Christian counselor. And uh, we're celebrating our 35th anniversary uh, as a practice at Christian Psychotherapy Services. We have six offices at Hampton Roads. One probably right next to, we're like 7-Eleven. Not really, but it's, so, uh, but we do, the need was there, and uh, so it, it worked out. But we do have offices in uh, Newport News, Norfolk, uh, Chesapeake, uh, Suffolk. Our main office is at Pembroke One. We have one on the Eastern Shore. If anybody, anybody there from the Eastern Shore today? We have one in on Hancock. So uh, if you can say that three times. But anyway, so, uh, but we've been blessed, and um, so I'm here rep representing our group, but I'm really here representing Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So, my task is to talk about what Andy wanted to talk about, because he gave us the topic. So, uh, <laughs> it, so, it isn't like, oh, I think I'll go talk on this. I prepared this based on what he said, and he's my boss uh, when I come to his church. And I do know, know them both. They're wonderful people. And I know you love them as pastors. And give them a big hand. Uh, and, and, you know, and they're slaving hard because they're in Rome. You know, when, in your, when you're in Rome, you slave, of course. I mean, it's really a terrible thing. I'm sure they're eating pizza on the uh, Bizaza, and they're going to go see the Colosseum this afternoon. I don't know if that's true. But anyway. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, you realize that this is National Mental Health Awareness Month, and I think that's why Andy decided to use this um, series of talks. And so I'm, my job is to talk to you about the integration of spiritual, psychological, and physical or body uh, aspects, okay? So when God created humans, with the body, he gave it, he cued it with the body and he gave him a mind. And then he breathed in life. And when he breathed in life, it was the spirit of life that became our soul. And so, one of the things that we're going to look at is soul today. But what is psychology? Well, psychology is considered a science. Um, if you're, a, I went to a secular school to, to be trained as a clinical uh, psychologist, so I learned all the theories of all kinds of theories about what makes up a human being, how they think, their emotions, about their bodies, how uh, different uh, things work in the body, the pituitary gland, our hormones, those kinds of things. It makes us complete. And one of the things I, I learned, because while I was in that program, I became a Christian. Isn't that interesting? Now, I grew up as a Christian, uh, but then, you know, moved away from that and didn't really pay much attention to it. But then, when I was in my doctoral program, I became a Christian. I actually became a born again believer. And it was an amen for me, let me tell you, because it changed everything. My mind was totally changed. And so, I'm looking at all the stuff I'm learning and saying, well, wow, this is bunk. It's really bunk. It, re it really is. But there is some truth in it. There's some truth in the field of psychology. So I'm not throwing that all out because there, you know, God gives revealed truth to people. Even, even to atheists. Can you believe that? Yeah. And that's true because he can do anything he wants to because he's God. So anyway, while I was going through that process, I found out that there was a lot of, in psychology I didn't use or want to use, but there were some things I could use, those things that measured up with what Scripture said. So in my journey, I, I kind of uh, let God lead me and develop me into a Christian person. I'm a Christian first, okay, and I'm a professional psychologist second. 
And so I do Christian counseling. So with that said, one of the things, the difference between a secular psychologist and a Christian psychologist is that a Christian, um, well, let me talk about a secular psychologist because they study the human thoughts, emotions, and behavior. A Christian psychologist studies the, <clears throat> the human, excuse me, <clears throat> the human thoughts, emotions, behavior, and the spirit and soul. And so when I see clients, part of what I'm doing, I'm doing soul work. Soul work, why? Well, because the role of our soul is it is our being and it is immortal and it's separate from the body in death. Okay, so that soul is going to continue on into eternity. Now I've asked this every service, so I'm going to ask in this service. Is your soul going to be where you want it to be when you pass over? Yeah. That wasn't very resounding. <laughs> I heard three yeps. <laughs> is your soul going to be where you want it to be when you Amen. pass over? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let's get down now. <laughs> so, I know this is a charismatic church, so i got to get into that a little bit. So, And charismatic means just wonderful, isn't it? It's all about the glory of God. So, so, so your soul is really important, isn't it? Now, your soul really is, is part of your personality. So one of the things, when we study personality and uh, psychology... The definition of that is there's, it's a complex of characteristics that distinguish an individual, especially in relationships with others. Now, we also know from Scripture that there's not one other person on this earth that has a personality just like you. It's unique. There's nobody just like you, even an identical twins. Anybody here had identical twins? Anybody? Or know somebody? Well, and their personalities are just as different as night and day. And God created you that way. Why? Because he wanted to. He knew you before you were ever in your mother's womb. And so he knows us before we were even a thought. I mean, how awesome is that and how humbling is that? So, your personality is what goes to heaven. Even though I'll get there, and I think I mentioned this in the other servers, when I'm there I'm going to be younger. I'll be <laughs> handsome. I'll have hair, more and more hair. And I won't be as big as I am, I'll be thin. <laughs> and, uh, but what you're going to recognize me by is my personality. Because that's what went. Okay? You're going to recognize that. So that's the thing we hope for. So part of my work is to help people find their personality. And if there's problems with what's going on with their uh, mental health, then I try to help them that way. But uh, one of, one of the things that, that we have to look, look at that psychology is a, has some truths. It's, they, they have relative truths. It's a relative truth. It's not absolute truth. There's only one absolute truth, and that's what? The Bible. The Bible. All right. The Bible. It's the absolute truth of God. That you can always rely on because it's, it's going to be the same today as yesterday and tomorrow. And that's what we take hope in. So, Let's talk a little bit about uh, mental health disorders. I've br broken it down in two areas. One is situational disorders. Now, everybody has situational disorders. That means if you're stressed out about something, you might be anxious. I know if I'm stressed out about a payroll, let's say, for, and I'm going, gosh, we're running short this month. What happened there? The insurance companies aren't paying. So I'm feeling anxious, and I'll dream about that a little bit. That's situational anxiety. Now, I'll pray about it. I pray, well, Lord, put some more money in the bank, even, if, but, but that usually doesn't work. But we all go through that because we're, 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 we're in this world. We're not of this world, but we are flesh. And so we're going to have situational stress. So it can either be situational anxiety. It can be situational depression. Uh, it can be uh, with children. How many people have children in here? Okay. And we work with children from age two all the way up through geriatric. You know, when you're two, you act like a child, and the older you get, you start acting more childlike again. That's it. I've noticed that with myself, and my kids can surely, well, anyway, we won't go there. But the point being is that sometimes they'll have situational problems, one called oppositional defiant disorder, ODD. That's a very common, common diagnosis that we've made, and that means that your child argues with you, doesn't do what they're supposed to do, and they're defiant. Go do that. No! No! 
Okay. So, and then when they get older and they become adolescents, then it becomes a conduct disorder. And that means they argue with you and they're defiant, and then they fight, and then they fight with kids at school and so, so forth. But they're situational behavioral disorders. So we handle those kinds of disorders differently than we do neurobiological disorders. Uh, PTSD starts off as a situational disorder. It's acute stress that can turn into post-traumatic stress disorder. We work with a lot of combat vets that come back. I see them. I see SEALs, uh, Army, Marines uh, that have PTSD. A lot of them don't want to come in and get help. Why? Well, one reason is because they're men. Uh, and, and they're soldiers and they're sailors and they're Marines. And so sometimes they don't want to get help for it. And, and that's true in general. Most, most people that come to a practice, most of the time it's going to be the women that come. They're going to bring their, their husbands uh, sometimes. I'll ask them, I say now, and what is your reason being here? Well, I want some help with their marriage. And, and then I'll ask the husband, what's your reason being here? Because she made me come. I said, well, that's great. <laughs> However, you've heard that joke, haven't you? What's that? How many light bulbs... Uh, I mean, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, it's only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. So, see, that wouldn't work. <laughs> now, I know I'm looking at you, and you don't know. You know I don't know you, so. But anyway. <laughs> but we're not sure, are we? No. Okay. So, those are situational disorders. Now, neurobiological disorders, these are the more severe types of disorders where there's an actual change in the brain chemistry. Okay? Uh, that can include things like sch schizophrenia, major depression, generalized anxiety disorder, also obsessive compulsive disorder should be in that list as well. Uh, bipolar disorder, ADHD, psychosis, delusional disorders. And so what happens there, you actually have changes in your brain chemistry. There are essential chemicals in the brain that keeps you s stable to be able to deal with stress. And uh, one of them is serotonin, another one is norepinephrine, and another one is dopamine. So there's medications out there that help replenish those. That's a simple explanation. Now, certain psychotic disorders like schizophrenia require different types of mood stabilizers, antipsychotic medications. And when they take that, it actually helps their distorted thinking. So if they're delusional, if they're thinking they're uh, Napoleon, bought Bonaparte or they're having, they're seeing things that aren't there, it will remove those symptoms. It will not cure it, but it will remove those. And so there are times that medications have to be used in those instances I just mentioned. Even major depression. Major depression is a common cold of all mental health. There's more people that come in depressed than, than any other uh, diagnosis. So major depression you have chemical changes take place. You're doing fine, and then all of a sudden you start feeling tired, you, you're fatigued, you start having problems with concentration and focus, uh, you start feeling bad about yourself, you think you're ugly, you, you go through all this stuff, you have uh, all this painful thinking about all the bad things you've done, and up to that point you were a, a churchgoer feeling really good, reading the Bible and all that, and you go, what's going on? So if you came in and saw me, I would get, give you a little checklist just to see whether or not you have situational depression or whether you have major depression, which is a clinical depression. Because at that point, if I'm trying to treat you, I want to do the best method I can use, both psychotherapy or counseling, plus medication if needed. Not everybody that goes to the doctor needs medication. And there are a lot of medications that are give, given out by primary care physicians. If there are any in here, please forgive me, because I know you're not one of them. But primary care physicians that come and you say you're depressed, they'll automatically give you a medication. Many of them do. M many of them will refer to a group like mine and for an evaluation to make sure you're okay. So with that said, there is a place for me medication. Um, and so you usually can be on that me medication for up to about eight or nine months, and then you stop that, you do counseling, and it helps you so you don't get to that place again. And so that can help. It really does work. Uh, so let's move into some biblical examples of mental disorders. And one of the first ones I thought of, and I was thinking about this, so there's got to be, it, it, they don't describe, they don't say, oh, and by the way, Moses had a diagnosis of blah, blah, blah. I came up with that. I figured, well, 
let me go ahead and see. But it does describe behavior. So the first ones I thought of was right in Genesis. You know, God created Adam and Eve, and he gave them this paradise to live in. Aha, how nice is that? Here they are going along, don't have to work, just pluck some fruit, you know, whatever they had to eat. They didn't have to work for it or do anything. God came and walked with Adam. they talk. And then what happened? The fall. And we know that uh, uh, Eve messed up. And um, <laughs> no, Adam and Eve messed up, didn't they both? They were both deceived by the serpent, who was Satan. And they were going to eat from the tree of knowledge. And as soon as that happened, what happened? They, be they got shame. They were shamed. They were ashamed. They ate that and they felt shame. And they were walking around, just covering themselves up. And what did God do? He kicked them out of the garden. And so there they are sitting out there. Adam had never seen a weed. Now there's nothing but weeds. He has to toil in the soil to make enough food to survive. And Eve had to give birth with pain. That Eve, man. So anyway, the point being is that what? I'll tell you what, if I'd been in paradise and I got kicked out of it, I'd be having post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd be beating on the gate, please let me in. Um, but it was too late at that. But guess what? God had a plan. And we're part of it, right? Are we going to go to paradise? Absolutely. So, so, um, and that's great, thank you. <laughs> um, so, and then we look at people like Moses. Uh, he had situational anxiety. Remember, he killed the, the soldier that was beating up on the slave. And then he ran away for 40 years. And he was anxious and worried. He got married, and then God came and talked to him. And was he happy about that? Not really. He's like, oh, I can't do that. No, I, I'm, I'm all anxious. I can't even talk. <laughs> and so he had... Uh, I think he had some situations. I think he had panic attacks. I think he was afraid to talk. Well, blah, blah, blah. So, so anyway, God helped him th through that. But isn't it neat to see that Moses, Moses, for goodness sakes, was having some of the same problems that we all have. Abraham, I mean, you know, he was a father of the nation, of a nation, right? And so what, what did he do? Well, he gave up his wife as his sister to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh paid him for that. Now, what was he thinking about? Well, he was afraid, and he had fear, and he had anxiety. He didn't want to die. So that was the excuse he had. I'm sure you would love that, ladies, if your husband said, hey, hon, why don't you act like my sister? And then, um, then when the Pharaoh takes you into harem, you know, he'll give me a lot of money. Maybe I can buy you back. <laughs> I would be, oh, okay, that's a great plan. So, so... And then Elijah. Now, Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets of all time. You know, they thought John the Baptist was Elijah at one point. They thought Jesus may be Elijah. But Elijah was at his game, the top of his game on Mount Carmel, when they called down the, the fire from heaven, and it came down and it burned up his wood. They had been trying for days to try to get theirs going. Baal worshippers, the priests. And he called it down, and it worked. And everybody believed, yes, your God is greater than our God. Jehovah God is greater than our God. And Elijah, yeah. And then he heard that Jezebel was coming after him. What did he do? He ran away. And he ran, and he ran. He was sitting in a, a riverbed under some tree, like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> now, I didn't quite describe that in Scripture, but I can visualize that. Get, ah. And God sent an angel. And, he, and all his symptoms sounded to me like he had major depression. So the angel came and talked to him, fed him, gave him some stuff, gave him some encouragement. He talked to him, he got him up and going, and he went back to being the great prophet. Now, Elijah did, didn't die, did he? Now, what did he do? He went up to heaven in a whirlwind, didn't he? Exactly. Moses died. So there you go. <laughs> you figure that one out. <laughs> so uh, going quickly here. So, uh, and then Saul, um, we think he had Bible. He was the first king of Israel. I read that. You know, he was up all night. He was kind of manic. He couldn't sleep. And then people that have bipolar, they have a difficult time sleeping. And they sometimes they have nightmares and dreams and all that kind of stuff. And what did David do? He came in. He was playing all these instruments. I think it was a lair he was playing. And then it would calm Saul down. 
And so what, what does Saul do? Well, Saul still tried to kill David, right? But the end of the story was he ran on his sword and killed himself. He actually committed suicide. Uh, I think he had bipolar. And then David, a man after God's own heart. David, wow. He had situational anxiety and depression. And, uh, and the reason was because he created that circumstance himself, didn't he? Don't you think sometimes that we create our own stress? I mean, I do say, I wonder why I did that, because I'm really struggling right now. Well, David, he did the same thing. He committed adultery, and he murdered a man, the husband of Bath Bathsheba. And, you know, the consequence of that behavior was what? He lost his child in birth. He lost his, his whole family, his, his son who tried to kill him, and he lost another son, and, uh, and then his, uh, the, the, his si sister was raped by a half-brother. And so he was a lousy father, and he was not a, um, a good husband. I wouldn't say that. It, and I'm, I'm sure if David was here, well, I probably wouldn't say that to him. But <laughs> if he was, he would admit, yes, when I was in the flesh, I was not. But there was something different about David than, than Saul. They were both kings, but there was a difference. Why was he? And I'll talk about that later. And then we get to Peter. And so Peter's very unique. He was always doing something impulsively, wasn't he? And so he would be impulsive here and impulsive there and everywhere. So one of the things that, uh, oh, I'll do it. And he would always talk. Blah, 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 blah. And hey, I'll do it. I'll never deny you. Well, no, no, not me. I want to go up there. And so, you know, one of the last things he did was cut the soldier's ear off, you know. And Jesus is going, Peter, you didn't take your medication today, did you? <laughs> and uh, so, so Peter probably had ADHD, okay? And he probably was a little OCD as well. And then we have J Jesus. Now, obviously, Jesus did not sin, but he had stress. He was tempted in all things that we are tempted in, even the going through stress. Remember, he sweated blood. He sweated blood. And what, what was he doing? He was out there praying Why? His disciples were sleeping. He said, yeah, all you can do is sleep. Then he went back and he prayed. But he sweated blood. And, but he, and he went to God and he said to his father, you know, not my will, but your will be done. And when that happened, he had peace in his heart. Okay? He asked that cup to be removed, but it wasn't. But, he, but how did he handle it? He handled it in a way that his father gave him what? That peace. So, so what, do you, what do you do? if you're going to go out and get help. If you're going to go, go get help, you can call, talk to your pastor, you can talk to other people in the church, or you can seek professional help. And that's why I think God brought us here, at least me. And, uh, and so one of the things, if you're going to choose to see somebody, you want to seek wise counsel. It says that in Scripture. Seek ye wise counsel. So who is the wisest of wise in Scripture? Solomon. He really was. That's right. He had the, if he had the wisdom of Solomon. Now, I don't have the wisdom of Solomon. Um, sometimes I do. It just depends on how it happens. And th this is what, what I mean, though. Sometimes when I'm in a session with a client or a patient, and this is true for all my other therapists as well, there's something that goes on there because there are, there are four people there, uh, or four persons. It's the, the therapist, it's the client or patient, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Because we pray and ask for that to be there. Now, whether that patient knows we've prayed at that point for them to be there, we do pray for that. And so we know when two or more gather in his name, he's there. And so that's an important part. Why? Because why would you go see somebody that doesn't have the same faith or value that you have? Wouldn't make, make any sense, would it? How is that going to work? It's not going to work. Remember, we're doing soul work. It's not just your situational stress. So one of the statements of faith that um, is there, uh, the statement of faith is this is what all the therapists in our group believe. Uh, and, and this is a requirement. They have to believe that. So we believe in God our Father, Creator and Sustainer, Jesus His Son, who redeems and rules us, His Holy Spirit revealed to us through His inspired Word, the Bible, our infallible God of faith and conduct, both personally and professionally and through the communion of Christ. Okay? 
So, one of the things um, we want to look at is what kind of principles are you going to get to use with a client? So, as, as a therapist, I've been training a whole bunch of di different things. And as I said, some of that stuff in psychology is bunk. But I try to use the ones that have truth. Uh, that are very sim similar to what God would do. Now, God is a logical God. He's a logical God. He created everything in order. If He didn't create it in order, the planets would be colliding. If He didn't create it in order, we wouldn't even see a spring. I mean, when I go out and see spring, I know God's there. He's in creation, isn't it? Even Paul said, you know, you may not know God, but if you go out and look at His creation, you know there is a God. How in the world can you dispute that? I don't even get in arguments with people that want to do that. Don't talk to me about evolution. I'll listen. I'll be nice. <laughs> but then in my mind, I already know the answer to that. So it is, and it's not being arrogant. It's being, it's actually being humble because I don't argue with people that just don't have the truth. I, but an opportunity may come where I can share that with them, the truth of who Christ, who is our creator. So, so one of the things we do, we do family origin issues. That's Exodus 34, 6 through 7. And that talks about the sins of the father passed down to the third and fourth generation. And so when I'm working with somebody or a therapist is working with somebody, we ask them that information. Tell us about your family of origin. Where do you come from? Mom, dad, grandparents, as much as you can remember. Because what are we looking for? We're looking for, are there any history of mental illness? Is there anything going on? They may not have been diagnosed with it, but they may have it. Because there is a genetic predisposition for some of those neurobiological ones I talked about. We also look at other things like dysfunctional family types of things. Did you grow up in a, a secure home? Did you grow up in a divorced family? Did you grow up in an alcoholic home or an addiction uh, home or whatever? Because that's important and it's going to affect you in a way that you may not even know. Because how do you know as a child that you're growing up in a dysfunctional family? You don't know. You go, huh, I thought everybody was like that. I have people come in and say, I thought everybody was like that. I didn't know my friends had parents that were like, wow, they're cool. Well, why are they cool? Because they were together. They didn't argue and yell and scream. You know, some, parents, some kids will come in and they'll say, I'm embarrassed to have my friends over because my parents act so crazy. And I know none of you all are like that here. <laughs> So, and I have my own thing. Uh, my, um, my mother grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was from a divorced family. They got married. And they loved each other and they stayed together the entire time. But because they had been through that dysfunction, it created difficulties for them. And so when they parented, it was a little bit different than normal. Uh, so my, uh, my mother would yell, scream, holler, and hoop about everything. Ah, okay. You know. <laughs> So, and then, then she calmed down. Now, she didn't drink, but, she, but what she was acting out was what my grandpa did. So, I'm going, huh. So, I grew up, so we, I would say, well, we're just really assertive people. No, we yelled, hollered at each other. So, so I made a determination when I got married and had children, I wanted to be different. I wanted to stop that in that generation. I don't want my kids going through it. Now, I'm not perfect. Matter of fact, my, my, my son and daughter-in-law are here today. I'm not going to point them out to embarrass them. But, and I wouldn't want him to get up and say, yeah, yeah, Dad, right, it's really true. You really did change now. I don't want to. <laughs> but, but the point being is, is that I realized that I had to make some changes. So I didn't know any different. So I had to learn how. And so the part of learning how is to know what it is you have to be different then. If you don't know that you ought to be different than that, how are you going to learn it? Just becoming Christian doesn't mean you're going to change. I, I, I was a new creature in Christ, but did, I, did it change my behavior immediately? No. Didn't do it. And so Christians, you know, Christians are hurting people and they come to church. So everybody out here has some hurt at some level, right? And so we're here, but we're all in the communion of Christ, the body of Christ. So what, if you're hurting, it hurts everybody in here. If I hurt, it hurts you. What I told you hurt you. Is that right? But if when I tell you some praise story about how I'm an overcomer, it also helps you. It isn't like 
this church is different than the church down the street, we're all in the body of Christ. So that's a really important context. And so that's a very important thing if you're working with people, because we're held to a higher standard. If you're teaching somebody and you're teaching them falsehoods, or something just to get your way, you're, it says that we're going to pay for that. So anyway, that one, so I, don't, I got off on something else there. So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so family of origin. And then the cognitive behavioral therapy. Now what that is, cognitive behavioral therapy, is, you remember God created us in, in order. He's a logical God. So we think first, then we have an emotion, then we have a behavior, right? Except for you. Right. <laughs> I said I wouldn't do that. Did I? So now we all think, and we have, have an emotion, and then we have a behavior. And that's the way God cre- created us. So when we look at cognitive behavioral therapy, what we try to do is help people recognize that thoughts come into your head, okay? And they may be irrational or distorted thoughts. All right. That, those people don't like me. Why? Because they didn't look at me. Now, people do that at church all the time. They'll walk out. They didn't, they didn't even say hello to me. That must be, they must not like me. Well, maybe they were getting ready to look at their phone, you know. So we all distort in our thoughts. So part of the therapy is to help somebody recognize that you can control your thoughts and you can tell yourself the truth. I was talking to somebody after our last um, service, and he was t- talking about how he tells himself the truth. Now, he actually learned that a little bit on his own. I'm sure God helped him. But telling yourself the truth, not distort things. And so that's very important. But there's so many people, if you come from a dysfunctional family and everything was negative, how are you going to think? Negative. And even though you hear all these wonderful words, well, that's not for me because I didn't grow up that way. Haven't you heard that? So one of the things that my job is to help is, hey, listen, here's how God created you. And all that stuff is getting in the way. That's the brush. Those are the weeds. Now you got to come out of that and, and tell yourself the truth. And where are you going to find it? It's in Scripture. And through other believing Christians that will help you get there on your journey. So, um, so Philippians 4, 6, 8. That's, that's the one I like uh, to use. This is the N- NIV version. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, <coughs> which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, this is the important part, this is the cognitive therapy. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, if you just use that as your mantra, forget mantra, Use that as just the everyday thing. You got up and read that every day and you tried to do that. And I know it's hard because you always got the culture coming in. But that's, if you dwell on God in His Word, you can do it. Now some people can't do it. When you have major depression and stuff like that, sometimes they need extra help with that. But that is one of the keys for, for therapy. Now the other one we use is theophostic counseling that I use. It's a prayer counseling. I'm, anybody been exposed to that or used it. Okay. Well, theophostic counseling is a technique where we, I pray with the client, and uh, I ask Jesus and the Holy Spirit to come into the session. Come in their heart and minds and reveal to them what it is He wants them to know. All right. And so that happens. It may bring up a memory from way past about something they hadn't responded to. That it was something that they hadn't worked out or resolved. And it usually has to do with some anger they had towards somebody. And so I will ask them, say, well, if God is showing you that, would you be willing to turn that burden of anger over to Jesus? And they say, well, yeah. Okay, well, I want you to say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I'm tired of carrying this burden of anger towards whoever it is, Joe. I turn it over to you, asking you to give me the power to forgive them. Okay? And... In most cases, something happens. It's like, whoa, what happened there? Well, I, I felt a sense of Christ there. I felt the Holy Spirit. I felt something. So let me, let me get, 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 get to this part, because this is a piece I didn't put on there, and I don't know why I didn't. It's about forgiveness. So forgiveness, 
for situational disorders or neurobiological disorders. Forgiveness is that main gift that God has given us. The main gift. Now, he only did that because of his grace. You know, people will say, I'm not going to forgive them. Look at the terrible thing they did to me. I can't forgive them. I'm not going to forgive them. And you may have never heard, seen them for the last 20 years. Okay, well, then you hold on to it. So what happens when you hold on to it? It eats you up. And I'm not saying that directly takes you into depression. I'm going to say it's going to mess up other relationships you're having. And so when that happens, God is saying, you've got to turn your burdens over to me. Now, in 1 John uh, 9, it talks about God is faithful to forgive those who confess and repent. He's, he'll forgive you if, you're, if you confess and repent. What did David do that Saul didn't? He confessed and repented. And what happened? He was a, God, a man after God's own heart, even though he'd done those terrible things. You're not as bad as David. Neither am I. But, that, that, but that's not what is the defi- deciding factor, is it? It's the grace of Jesus Christ. So, so do yourself a favor. You need to, if you're struggling with stuff like that, you need to seek some help with that. You need to seek somebody you trust, go through that, I'm not talking about just doing a general prayer. Please forgive this. It's got to be situational. It's got to be this person did this to me and, and so forth. So not all counseling ends up that way, but most of the time, 90% of the cases, there's somebody that they need to get rid of some burden. All right, so I, I encourage you today and challenge you if you've got something like that going on in your heart and you haven't given it up, you need to. Now here's the other piece. It also says in... Um, Second Matthew six fourteen, that God is faithful to forgive you, but if you won't forgive others, He won't forgive you. Amen. So what are you going to do with that? <laughs> you can't say, "Well, just stick out in your pipe and smoke it." No, you're not. <laughs> so God wants us to be obedient. You know, I heard somebody said, uh, "Well, I follow all the ten suggestions." I was, <laughs> 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 well. We can't follow all those because they're tough. So, I mean, so, but here's the, here's the key. The key is if you're struggling with something, go, go get help, all right? Just go get it. Go see somebody that, 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 that you trust, that knows Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. So, based on what I said today, I'm, I'm praying, which I'm going to pray here in a minute, that that impacts your heart and mind, that you heard something from God or the Holy Spirit, and if you're not a believer, if you haven't made Jesus Christ your personal Savior and the Lord of your life, that's how I see it happening. You have to make Him your Savior before He can be the Lord of your life, okay? If you haven't done that, this would be an opportunity to pray about it because I'm going to pray and then uh, we're going to go, go from that point, okay? So pray with me. Father, thank you, Lord, for this gathering of believers and and lord i just pray that what we talked about today lord would glorify you and just open our hearts to your leading and guidance and lord if there's anything been said here that's contrary to your word lord just remove it from their memories but impact their heart lord if there's anything that was said here that's from you so we we praise you we claim your your power we claim your grace we strongly claim your love in our lives lord so uh, we just Give that all to you in Jesus' name. Amen.